Hello, Izumi Nation. At the end of the Gundam Unicorn podcast series that we did, Reina, Archimise, and I promised that we would return for Gundam The Origin. And so, here we are. Uh, we have just finished watching the first episode of Gundam The Origin, uh, the Blue-Eyed Cosfall, or, yeah, Blue-Eyed Cosfall. I keep wanting to add buzz. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yes, we have returned. So, sitting to my left, beautiful, and going to be my wife person, ho- by hopefully by this time next year, is... Reina Innocenti. Yes. Not that I run a toy review blog or anything now. Oh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, Plastic and Gold, check it out. Plasticandgold.tumblr.com. Check that out. Also, coming at us over the Skypes, we've got... Archimize. What you hey, working everybody. on? How's it going, Archimize? What you working on these days? Oh, mostly uh, work at a small business. Um, hmm. But I've also got a game project called uh, Social Critters. You can find us on Facebook. We're making a little... Game about racing pigs. <laughs> Fantastic. That sounds like fun. <laughs> it it, it actually it. is. It's a lot of fun. And if you're on the channel, you might know that I'm Nick Izumi. Hopefully. Hopefully, well, maybe. If you're new, welcome. We've reviewed other Gundam things. <laughs> check out the Gundam Feed Destiny podcast because it's kind of <laughs> less painful than actually watching the <laughs> uh, Plus, we sell merchandise from it, so... It's true. Um, based on Archimise's famous catchphrase, people are sheep and Lacus is God. But we're not talking about Gundam Seed Destiny today. Oh. We're, talk- we're talking about Blue-Eyed Castle, the new OVA that's coming out. Yes. The, the new Gundam. The Gu- new old Gundam. The new <laughs> old... The, the Gundam... The new Gundam series that takes place before any of the other Gundam series. And I, I'm holding it up, showing it off, even though you can't see it. Uh... I recommend strongly picking up Vertical's printing of the Gundam The Origin manga because it is beautiful, hardcover, and if it's too fast-paced for you in the mon- in the anime, this is definitely the route to go. Yeah, we have... Um, we Gun- have storyboards. Gundam The Origin, um, the uh, beloved Gundam manga, is getting its anime adaptation. Of course, they are only doing... Uh, Origin being a remake of the original, they are only doing the prequel chapters for this OVA. But, as uh, I think you're about to find from uh, what we're about to talk about, that's not a bad thing. It's definitely worth your time. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, we. Uh, this is a really exciting OVA. Um, so this one, we're not going to... In the past, in our Unicorn videos, we did a kind of a play-by-play of everything that happens. Uh, we don't feel the need to do that this time. We're just going to kind of go into talking, analyzing, and if you haven't watched it yet, do yourself a favor, go watch it. Either uh, rent it at Crunchyroll or go on to the PlayStation Network. Um, rent, the regular edition is like a $4, $4 rental. Now, we're not going to do a play-by-play. We're just going to, basically, we have, while we open with a nice uh, kind of incredibly CG version of the Battle of Loam, uh, we cut immediately back to long before the war had started, the Republic of Munzo. Um, we get to see the death of Zeon Zum Daikun, just as the Zeon movement is starting, and the fallout of his death and how it affected all of the people in this story. Including a lot of people getting run over by gun tanks. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of gun tanks. A lot of gun tanks. This is... This was Gun Tanks episode. This was. More than anyone else, this was really about Gun Tanks. This is better than Gun Tanks in space. <laughs> um, but really, uh, as the title suggests, this uh, focuses a lot on uh, um, Zeon Zim Daikun's children, uh, Kosval and Artesia, along with uh, such great characters as uh, a younger version of Rambaral, the Zabi clan, who are a bunch of scheming buggers even back then, and uh, even some of Ron Baral's, uh, pr- uh compatriots from the TV series. Uh, can I just, like, step back once so that we can actually explain who um, Zian Zim Daikun is for some people? Um, sure. Um, Zian Zim Daikun is the person who started the Zionic movement. It's where he wanted space independence. 
He was also a philosopher who believed in the expansion of the human mind and understanding, which he called the new type concept. Eh? Eh? I've heard Most of that Most of this name. was retconned in later throughout the series as the series kind of went on, but through Yasu's manga, it actually expanded on it even more and gave us an actual face for this. To their credit, like, the, uh, the images we get of him here do match the brief glimpses we got of him in the original movies. But, yeah, this actually fleshes him out a bit more, even though he's really barely in this. He's on screen for 15, 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> like that, no, yeah. he's on screen for five minutes. Come on. Yeah. Um, with that, actually, what a great transition. Um, do we want to start by talking about the characters um, in this? Because this is incredibly character-driven. If you came here for robots... Uh, you're probably... You have Gun Tank. You've got Gun Tank. Gun Tank is going to steal the show, and really bad CG Sharzaku's there, but... And if uh, you really, really, really <laughs> want the Battle of Loam, go buy Gundam vs. Zeta Gundam and play it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, the, we had a, a fantastic group of characters, and a fantastic cast and voice in them, too. Um, so who should we start with? Should we start with, uh... Pascal himself, the title I, character? I feel that we need to start off with the side characters before we touch on Pascal, because his part was so much later in the, in the episode. That's, that's yeah, true. It's, it's weird for the titular character. Pascal, this part in the story doesn't really come into play till like, the halfway point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, well, so side characters, who, do, uh, who are you going to start with? I would say we should start with Astraya. Astraya? Astraya. Astraya. And everyone who was more or less a side character, quote-unquote, in this one. So we meet, um, so yeah, Astraya is, um... So let's talk about Astraya and, and also about, uh, Uh, yeah, so we meet, uh, the Daikuns. We meet, uh, Kasval and Artesia, a.k.a. Shar and Sayla's parents. Um, and Astraya is, um, a former lounge singer who became... It, we basically find out that she was more or less Daikun's mistress, um, who bore him his two children. And they look a lot more like her than they do him. <laughs> I just... and, and it's also worth pointing out that it's, it's implied that the relationship with her is out of love and respect, whereas the relationship with his wife is one done out of a political aspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We get to meet her, and we really weren't sure who she was. Yeah, they they weren't very... They uh, Admittedly, the anime was much more clear that it was Daikun's wife than the manga was. The manga, I just thought she was someone who funded Daikun's work, but... I honestly thought she was a baroness who raised him. It doesn't help that she also looks like she's 70. Yeah, um... Uh, instead we get... But, yeah, Astraya is... Nothing good happens to this woman. <laughs> no, her her husband uh, dies of uh, mysterious circumstances, uh, seemingly of a heart attack, uh, and then she becomes very much uh, the center of the political machinations at work in the colony uh, yes. between the Zabis and even the Rawls. Even though the Rawls, uh, you know, are kind of the good guys. <laughs> Uh, in this world, they they have a, a great sense of honor and uh, and duty that they uh, uh, appeal to, and and uh, Zamba himself is charged with protecting that family. Uh, but yeah, she's <laughs> she's just kind of uh, struggling to keep her family safe in this world that's becoming very uh, tense and dangerous. Very political, very... You know, as you were saying that, Archimise, what crossed my mind, this is almost uh, the Gundam series for the Game of Thrones set, really. No kidding. Cause, <laughs> yeah. Because this is... This uh, episode, at least, was entirely political machinations and and characters stabbing each other in the back and, and bloodlines and betrayal. Uh, it was much... <laughs> much heavier stuff than what Gundam normally deals with, 
and quite welcome, if you ask me. So, uh, a little point on, we can get into it in our favorite scene section. That it also had a great, some great moments of levity. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to say, like, this isn't, you know, as much as it is a very um, serious and, and political kind of drama, uh, it really did well to, to pace itself and let us come up for air. It wasn't just this overbearing, like, posturing and angst throughout it was it was very well paced the levity was used perfectly i agree yeah they because they it needed it in a lot of spots um on that thank you lucifer (laughs) on that note should we talk about uh um seeing of the side characters probably one who's going to be a real standout in this story i'd like to talk about ron baral okay um I think it was really cool that Ron Baral got to be a main character in this story. He is, uh, everyone remembers him from the original series, pilot of the goof, one of the legitimately nice people within Xeon. And in this, we get to see his formative years, and he's in a really tough position in this. Oh, yeah. C- I mean, his, oh, go ahead. Dad, uh, I was just going to say, like, his, his dad is uh, in, like, one of the leading families that, you know, completely against the zombies, and uh, and and he's again charged with protecting the uh, the Daekun family, and uh, and he really has to. He's a military guy already, and so he has those responsibilities as well. <laughs> um, and, and but he he really does well to you know be thinking uh, ahead of everybody as much as he can. Can I also point out that he's not strictly a Zeon, a, a quote-unquote Zeon at this point, either. He actually is part of the Mondo... Munzo. Munzo Liberation Theater. Yeah, he, he's part of the Colony Defense Force, because Zeon proper hasn't really started yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he's also trying, like, he's trying to be a good son, but at the same time, he can see that the Zabis have the kind of political sway that it's not safe to to go outright against them. And also knowing that his father's a warped, warped individual. Yeah, Jim Barral is clearly not a very stable man. <laughs> and it's we'll full it. of... <laughs> like, well, I mean, poor Ramba. He, he is, his dad has like a doomsday bunker, he and, and he's screaming at not just at Astraya, but at her children, that Zeon Zumdaikun was assassinated. He was assassinated, I say. Okay, you know what? I'm going to Photoshop that old man yells at Cloud <laughs> <laughs> Just for this, because it's, it's appropriate. No, yeah, we need it, because Jim Baral is not a stable human being. Ramba, on the other hand, yeah, we get some really great stuff. Reyna, you got to point out, and we can transition into the other character I really want to talk about, but... We even, fe- uh, Raina even noticed in Wall, uh, one of the, re- uh, his, his blue obsession, his, <laughs> his love of blue is still here, but, um, yeah. he actually has an underlying meaning, and it's driven home even more so in a fully colorized version of the origin, because you couldn't see the colors in these particular scenes. If you notice, the person who is to become his wife, she is wearing a blue dress, and she's got blue eyes. Yeah, Is she a white dragon. Yeah, she, <laughs> she might be. With how she was behaving, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, Crawley Hamon, uh, who I, you know, I'm not sure if they beautiful actually beautiful lounge singer and amazing, amazing intelligence officer and spy. Uh, Ramba gets some great scenes in this, but Hamon, holy crap! Crowley Hamon probably stole the show. They get yeah, they gave her the best part she's ever had. If you didn't think her and Cecilia both stole the show, quite honestly. If you didn't think much of her character before, this OVA is going to it's going to make you understand why Ramba had her on the front line with him all the time during the original series. Holy crap! Uh, and it's a version of Peggy Carter. <laughs> Yeah, she she kind of is. Uh, and honestly, she was even cooler than she was in the manga. Yeah, in, in this, she she got her own action sequence. Uh, well, she got put in the manga, too. It just wasn't nearly as cool. Uh, she basically is the one who plots the, get, how to get the children safely out of zombie-controlled z- space. It's amazing. She is just... 
the bomb. In like this. I said, number one intelligence agent in spy. I like, I like how I, <laughs> I like how Archivist put it. She's like uh, she's like Zeon's agent Carter. Except better. <laughs> Um, well, one thing I would like to also mention, um, speaking of, of Ramba, is, uh, I, I, and I, I mentioned this uh, while we were watching, is he reminds me so much of Bright. Yeah. Uh, if, if you look at his hair, like... His, the way he marches, too. Yep. Uh, How he switch. adjusted yeah. his collar before he walked into the room to meet Cosfall and Artesia. Exactly. He, he's bright with a mustache. And I, I can't I'm fine with mustache, right? I can't imagine that that wasn't done on purpose. Like, because there's supposed to be a lot of parallels. We know that Ron Baral is a good man. We've always known that. That's part of his character. He was on the opposite side of Whiteface, but he was a good human being. And, mm -hmm. yeah, we see here that him as a young officer is a lot like, if not just like, young Bryce. And, ugh. It, it, it makes, seeing the original series makes that all the more tragic in what's to come, but I think even on its own, this OVA episode stands up really well. And I'm also yeah. going to point out there that Maul's love of children. Yes. He Maul's has death. a profound adoration of Sela in particular, as if she were his own daughter. That is the kind of levels of protection that he goes into on her behalf. Because at first he's all tense and everything as any normal human would be. Especially in, when you're seeing kids who's, who's whose father just died, died. under um, really mis uh, sketchy circumstances, no less. <laughs> and, and the first thing, the first thing she does is she's like this toddler. She goes over, pulls on your sleeve, and it's like, Yank it on Someone the help me save my kitty. Whisper, whisper, whisper. It's my cat. <laughs> He's all alone. <laughs> it was really cute. Same and so, Rambo leads a full-on military expedition to catch this cat. <laughs> to save this It's fantastic. It's in his blue all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that that scene was actually better in the manga because you actually saw the level of forces that he brought to the party, but <laughs> I loved seeing it in the very short, sweet and condensed version of the, yeah. of the capturing Lucifer mission. It was super cool. And again, it was like one of those moments of levity we were talking about. Again, we were just following this really tragic event. Lucifer and, is the levity. And Lucifer, this cat, uh, is... We're sent on this expedition to go catch him. Because we don't That's want him to be... Raven here. <laughs> yeah, they, they use the cat perfectly. Um, and now, uh, admittedly, a lot of what made this OVA good is that it is drawing so well from the source material. But that is not a bad thing in any way, shape, or form. Origin is the only Gundam manga that you absolutely need to read. That's... Sorry, people who like any other Gundam manga. I'm not saying that there aren't other good ones, That's right. but Origin is the best. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, we'll throw some more on this. But yeah, no, definitely, Origin is, you know, top of the line. No, Origin, Origin is something to read, even if you don't like Gundam. Yeah, it, it's just, it is the book to check out. This OVA, though, it's... It is already a very strong companion to the original series. It is a worthy prequel. Um, while we're on these characters, should we talk about the zombie clan? Our, yeah. our enemies. Why, why don't you start with your favorite son of Zabi? <laughs> oh, yeah, my favorite. I'm, I, I'm just pulling your leg here. He don't actually like Sazro, but it's important to mention him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we all know the, the main Zabi clan members, Dagwin, Girin, Cecilia, Dozel, and uh, Garma. And then we meet Sazro, another brother, who some people uh, might think, including I briefly made that mistake, I thought he was a character invented for Origin. He actually is a character from Tomino's original notes, uh, who is mentioned briefly in the original novels, and uh, he did exactly what the original novels commented that he did. Uh, uh, he, 
in passing, Giran is like, I wish my brother Sazro was still alive. He would have been quite useful as a governor. Oh well, he got killed during infighting. And sure enough, he gets assassinated. All we really know is that he was an asshole. I mean, honestly. The, the, the first, one of the first scenes we have um, with the zombies... Oh, go ahead. It's more or less implied that he's the one who started the plot to drug Dean and Daikun. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But then he is, yeah, like, archivized, like you were going to say. Yeah, the one of the first scenes we see with him uh, immediately following the, the death um, of, of Daikun is uh, the... Zavi family kind of uh, running into each other. And Cassilia, uh, we actually had a really, I, I guess we're transitioning right into her, we had this really balanced uh, scene with her driving off this mob of people, um, which was really cool, riding on horseback, coming over the hill, <laughs> like the Rough a Riders. Really short horse. <laughs> yeah. The pony. And, but, um, Not a pony, the <laughs> short horse. She had she let the the, the Daikun family go, and uh, Sazero like slaps her across the face for the and, and she, uh, slaps her hard. She's bleeding, she's like bleeding. And and Dozo, you know, he's he's shocked and alarmed. And there's so there's so much complexity in this family, um, but like we get this look from Cecilia. You know, she is absolutely oh, vengeful. Oh, that's a blood stare right there. <laughs> It's, and so while they're while they're driving uh, in this procession, there's two two uh, zombies to a car, and Dozo and Sazero are sitting next to each other, and then it just blows up underneath him. Now, and it's implied now uh, it's, it's implied that Sazero was killed by the zombie by someone within the zombie family to uh, to pin blame on the on the Wall Clan, but it's. It, it's hard to not notice that Cassilia is the only one who doesn't look very shocked by the flaming wreckage. Just saying. Um, oh, and also worth pointing out... Also found out. <laughs> yeah. it, it's also worth pointing out she's not surprised when Dozel, like just crawls out of the burning wreckage. Like, this bomb went off literally in the seat next to him. He burst out of there just, like, covered in blood and screaming. <laughs> Like the Terminator. <laughs> got the scars, though. With the mm. rest of the zombies, um, I want to preface this before we go too in-depth. Something that was great about the original Gundam is that none of the zombies are one-dimensional bad guy characters. All of them are very complex, and we get that here. In one of mm-hmm. And I love it. Yeah, Cassilia, like, uh, like you were saying, Archimise, I loved how they introduced her. I loved how they used her. She's very stoic and masculine. And, <laughs> yeah. And she makes a point of that. She, she acknowledges that herself. She speaks in masculine terminology. Uh, she, she even um, kind of uh, she, um, goads on uh, Astraya when uh, Astraya says, Oh, you cut a very gallant form. And uh, Cassilia is just like, You were going to finish that with for a woman, weren't you? So the the oh. animation of her getting off that horse was pretty, like, even a small moment like that, it was pretty impressive. She's, there's a lot of great, just ca- really nice character animation moments in this. Oh, yeah. Um, Cassilia was, but yeah, Cassilia stands out. Dozel, also fantastic. We're, we're reminded here, and we got a little bit of that back in the original series of the Battle of Solomon, but... Here we really get to see that Dozel, despite him being a big bruiser who uh, can survive a bomb going off so near him, we still see that he's kind of a teddy bear underneath. He's his best dad. <laughs> he's really of the zombies. He he's, he's the only person who comes legitimately close to being good. Well, at this point, Garma hasn't done anything wrong. He's just a puss. <laughs> But, oh, no, Captain no, it's just Dozel. <laughs> but no, you're right. Like, Dozel, I, they even point out that, uh, I forget if it was Sazero or uh, Guren, they, they make a point to say, like, his he's too soft. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big burly guy. Uh, he, he stands, like, a whole person taller than everyone in the room. Uh, 
Mm. And, he's close and, to seven feet tall. And he, and he, you know, even throughout the, the episode, I, I was even kind of wondering near the end there, is like, I, I, I definitely got the impression that he did not want harm to come to the children of Baku. Mm. Like, he he really wanted to, to look out for them. Just Absolutely not. He, out of everyone there, it's, okay, this is going into the manga, but in okay. the manga, it's, it's apparent that he doesn't want a war. It, it's, he's the only one who doesn't want a war. It's even kind of implied that he would, that, uh, he do, didn't know about the Daikun assassination. Like, that he doesn't know that it's an assassination, that he's just kind of along for the ride. Uh-huh. I, at least that's the impression I get. Um, meanwhile, though, I, I, the same can't be said for Dagwin or Giren. Um, or Cecilia, for that matter. Or, cause, well, yeah, because they're schemers. With their plots. <laughs> I, uh, transitioning over to Giren, uh, we mostly get to see him being stoic and scheming, but that's always kind of been Giren's thing. We also get to see him playing Go in a awful-looking Howry. <laughs> <laughs> we I, get to see him playing Space Go on the leaderboards. He has the most variety in fashion. But, <laughs> but more, I, I guess more, more pressingly, though, with Giren, I love that he even, he recognizes so many things about his family. Like, he even calls out Cassilia at one point, leave the scheming to me, sister. Like, he knows that he is, he is a sociopath and a bastard. I'm sorry, he... He really, truly is. <laughs> yeah. And we get more of that here. I mean, this is... You can see Giren slowly becoming the dictator that we know he's going to become. Cassilia even mentions that he's trying to put together a thousand-year empire. As he's playing Go and his awful looking Hellry. Like, <laughs> side note, though. No, but, no, 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 don't... Please don't sidetrack right now. This is important. This is important. Because... This is the Nazi thing in Zeon done right. Not overtly everyone, you know, not the overt everyone being named Hans and Klaus and all, and, you know, and not doing the... doing the Hail Hitler salute. Yeah, and, and literally dressing the officers in SS uniforms. This is the scary, actual, yeah, like, actual fascism starting within Zeon, and that's really interesting. Oh, can I point out my favorite thing about the Z the zombie outfits that they were wearing when all this garbage went down? Mm -hmm. They're basically wearing what will become the Titans uniforms. The the dark blue on red. The dark. It was the dark red on blue. Yeah. It you you get that. It's beautiful. Yeah, you get that beautiful. It it, it makes Zeta all the. I all mean, the scarier. I mean, yeah, granted, I mean, they're doing that to kind of get that Nazi thing across. But yeah, it makes the, the poetry of Zeta even better, of the Titans just being a new Zeon. And yeah, that's really what it is. I mean, you even get it as far back as here. Um, as far as, as Daeglin goes, uh, you know, he, he's plotting as well. You, you see him do a lot of the kind of moving of, of and positioning of political power. Uh, speaking of moving, we actually saw him out of a chair. And smiling. <laughs> well, smiling after he's telling this family that, oh yeah, your uh, your your husband, your dad, he he died of this heart attack. Totally came out of nowhere. Who could have Dragon. expected that? When Degwin smiles, all turns to ash. He also said that I'm in charge now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cosfall's face when that happened, though. Mm. is so intense. Well, we've gotten through a lot. Should we get to Artesia and Cosfall at this point? I'd say. Yeah. Um, There's so, no one else left to talk about. <laughs> so our two mains in this are, of course, the childhood versions of the of two of the protagonists from the original, uh, Sela and Shar, or Artesia and Cosfall. Wow. Artesia <laughs> scenes. Oh, you are... made me cry. They are, there are a couple, yeah, of those levity scenes that she is key to, but so many of Artesia's scenes just rip your heart out. Um, and it, it, it's no small part, thanks to Megumi Han, 
um, playing her. She just knocked it out of the park. Uh, her mom played Lala in the original series, so I guess it's only appropriate that she be in this, but wow. Uh, she was so good. Some really... Uh, um, Argamize, uh, you wanted to point out something interesting you noticed about Artesia, though. Sure. Uh, they, there's a lot of uh, hints at her kind of new type ability manifesting, even at this young age. Um, in an opening scene, or in one of the opening scenes with her father, we actually, uh, he hugs her uh, one night. Uh, I, I'll, I'll step back a bit. He, he's talking about, like, you know, his big plan for his speech and everything. He's just really, uh, like, drained and exhausted and everything. And then he goes to his, his children's room, and he, he hugs Artesia, who is, you know, kind of sleeping and whatnot, and, and she starts blowing. And uh, in the manga, I know you guys, I haven't read that uh, book yet, but I know you kind of just mentioned, it's like, oh, it's just a little brighter. But in the OVA, she's like overtly glowing. And uh, the look on her father then, uh, looks like that exhaustion that he had is just kind of fading away and that it's like rejuvenating him, uh, which I, I thought was a really interesting kind of new type scenario and it really kind of goes towards that philosophy that he was really preaching about. To, to play devil's advocate, um, I mean, like you could also argue that a parent, when they're faced with their child, will often feel more energized or feel better, that sort of thing. But mm. the fact that they use the overt glowing, I, I think that you're onto something. I really do think that that's kind of a new type thing. And then later in the episode, too. Several times, actually. Mm. Yeah. There's um, there's one thing, and we'll probably go into the scene itself in a bit more detail because it's fun um, <laughs> and, and heart-wrenching. But uh, there's a scene where... Uh, Castell is actually uh, manning a gun tank, uh, the, the two big cannons on top of it, and he's shooting at uh, some enemy uh, mobile suits with it. And also gun tanks. Also gun tanks. <laughs> gun tanks and gun tanks. And the, you know, the scene's playing out in action and, and everything. We, the camera kind of moves back and forth between, like, within the cockpit and within, like, the action shot, so outside. And you hear people screaming and everything. And she, you know, she has this very, like, you know, terrified look of uh, probably a combination of the, the combat, the, the terror and everything. But I got the distinct impression that she was feeling the deaths that mm -hmm. Costco was causing with this this attack, uh, specifically because she, at one point, she screams for him to stop. And stop killing all those innocent people. All those poor people, yeah. That, like, it's not overt, uh, which I think is, is probably a good thing. Uh, but it, it was definitely the impression I was getting that she's already feeling that pain that other people have uh, and that is being caused by war. It's more empathy than you'd expect from a kid that age, yeah. It's also worth pointing out that she's only six or seven. There's no way that she'd know that there are other people in those robots. And let's exactly. Honestly, put those things together. I was about to say, uh, and even if she did, uh, yeah, you know, she's a little the, kid. She might. It, it doesn't connect all the time that other people get hurt at that age. Yeah. And I'm comprehending that there's people in those, those even, giant robot things. Even mm -hmm. Crosswall actually knowing instinctively how to do what he did in that scene was also hinting at the fact that he wasn't also infected. Yeah, yeah, you have, uh, that is, Cosfall's scene there is very much like when Amaro first gets in the Gundam, it's he just knows what to do. It's, and it, it's creepy, it's, it's creepy foreshadowing, and it would be so easy for that scene to be corny and stupid, and uh, phantom menace dare I say. But... Derp, 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 I know how to buy the gun tank, woo! But the, em the emotions are real, and it's there. And yeah, yeah, it, 
It's not that he's excited and happy, kind of like Anakin was, <laughs> like you were saying as a comparison. Now that's pod racing. Yeah. He's, he's it, not, it's, it's he's not screaming zone. no maniacal Lelouch laughter here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, he is incredibly intense, but that's really the word for Cosfall in this episode is intense. The, the kid is just... Mm, like, uh, Cosfall, he's he's really just kind of, you see him going along with things as the series goes on, but when he has his first confrontation with Cassilia, that's when you get, that's when you see the first seeds of Shar Aznabal being sown. But let's go back to Thela. Okay. Um, Thela, as the story keeps going, uh, you get moments with her with Hamon, too. Mmm. And... Again, with her mother as well, a lot of these things are parroted even five minutes apart from each other. These same phrases of Artesia's as she is sad and scared for the future, she talks about the promise she made with her mother, and then she talks about it again with Hamon, right as the credits are rolling. And if you've read Beyond, if you've read the manga, you were in tears because you know what that promise meant. Even if you haven't read the manga, you're in tears because, one, the scenes were set up masterfully, and two, the actor, the actors reading it are just killing it. Again, Megumi Han. And also she's, three Astrayas in a tower, like Rapunzel. <laughs> yeah. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Um, I'd say, yeah, I'd say Artesia and Lucifer are kind of the emotional heart of this episode. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if they follow the manga, they kind of continue to be for most of this part of the story. Yeah. Which is... I just, I just realized that at the end... That everyone together. I just realized at the end that she's dressed as a witch and has a cat. Yeah. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> Don't deny it. I right, uh I think we'll only Let's wrap up and with uh with Castle oh. and uh and then we can talk about some favorite scenes because we skipped a couple character moments because they're wonderful scenes. <laughs> and I definitely want to talk about it. Don't worry, we'll get we're gonna get through it. Um Cospel, the intense badass. You can see Cospal is violently shaken out of his childhood. It, and into adulthood, and as this OVA plays out, even over the just, like, 62-minute runtime, his soul is already being eaten from the mm. inside. And we we'll get... Go ahead. Continue? <laughs> I was just going to say that, uh, well, what's great is that, is, is that it's a progression, too. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not like you know, some shows would, would go like that he's straight cold. Um, right away, we definitely get to see we get to see emotions play off on him um, in a lot of scenes with his with his family, his mother and his sister. You know where where they're discussing you know what what their future holds for them and how terrifying and dangerous it is. You can see uh, that mix of emotions that he has going on. That he he's sad and terrified um, about what that future means, but he's also putting this, you know, putting his armor on because he knows he has to be strong to stand against it. Oh, yeah. I like to call all of what Cosfall went through in this episode his loss of hope and his last happiness. It really, yeah. This is the last time you really get to see him be happy is part of this. And the moments at the very end as the credits roll are probably one of my favorite scenes, but we'll get to that, and this also ties right back into that. I want to go back to what Archimedes was saying. I'm going to compare this to a show that I don't like right now that is astoundingly doing well. Um, this isn't Gotham. <laughs> this, this isn't, this isn't uh, oh, my parents died and now I'm, I'm automatically Batman. I don't go through, my grieving is momentary and I just become, it wasn't my grieving is momentary and now I'm magically Char Aznable. Like, we are still seeing Cosfall grow. He, it, he, like you said, Archimedes, it's gradual. It's not just he's instantly the character we know him as, even as a child. 
he still has a lot of growing up to do, and this is going to color, everything that happened to him is going to color him and twist him into the person we know him as. Yeah. Do you want to go to, like, moments now, like scenes? So yeah, um, I think we've talked about the characters. What are some other favorite scenes, guys? Let's talk about that. Uh, don't start with me. Okay. I'm, like, I've got like three. You've got like a zillion. All right, Alchemize, <laughs> do you want to start out? Um, we already kind of touched on the, the hunting down of the cat. Oh, yes. Uh, but the scene that follows where Ramba uh, goes to the bar is pretty fun where we meet um, Hamon, uh, kind of for the first time for this uh, series. And all of his compatriots, the, the bar guys and everything. Yeah, we get to meet uh, a bunch of his uh, guys from the Gallup crew. That was really before I they love, were his crew. <laughs> I love that his, it looks like like this crazy disguise and makeup that he's got on. He's like all scarred and smells of booze and just looks all disheveled and everything. And then Hamon comments on that and he's like, well, <laughs> it's not all makeup. <laughs> he's like cleaning himself up and he's, the scars, scars remain. Really from the cat. Also, you got to see really dapper-looking Ramba in the trench coat. For some reason, he looked much more tense mm -hmm. and intense, and I don't know words. Ramba can pull off a fedora. I'll say that much. Um, another kind of quick scene uh, that yeah. really uh, helps set the mood is uh, we don't see it a whole lot in this because, again, the, the nations really haven't established themselves, but there's, you know, the great, the Federation is already this huge presence on the colony, and and, and those guys are just as scuzzy as they are in the future. I would say, yeah, uh, we, we kind of, it's hard to not sympathize with the colonists for wanting to start Zeon with just what a bunch of D-bags the Federation come off as in this. Mm -hmm. it, you're the stupid space noise, what you doing getting drunk tonight? Like, like, even, like, they'll roll down the middle of town in gun tanks. Mm-hmm. And run. They'll shoot up in the middle of downtown with gun tanks and real, uh, other tanks. It's just, it's just this giant military presence that, um... It's completely unnecessary in an otherwise peaceful yeah. zone. Yeah, and, and, you know, we see the... The guys in, you know, what become the Xeon uniform, um, the, just the, uh, you, you name what they are, they're kind of like the, the security force of the colony. Yeah, the, the green. You're already seeing the, ten the tensions that will turn into the war starting. It's not going to be like a, just a, the war magically started one day. This is This has been a series of politics and... And e evolution, and it hasn't. It wasn't just you know one day they were enemies. This bi this built up from something. And um, I I don't want to steal all the scenes, but I, I know one of us will talk about the power scene. Oh no, uh, go for it. Now, Raina, did you actually want to take that one? Oh no. Uh, okay. Go for it. Okay, so one of my like absolute I think brilliant scenes in this was when um uh, Astaria. Astaria is is told that she uh, has to Astraya. stay in the uh, sorry, sorry. It's <laughs> I'm, I'm bad with things. It's uh, Banaji again. <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, this time uh, I'm not the one doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's told that she has to stay in this power. Um Mostly, like, kind of for political reasons, because, again, she was more like the mistress, but that she won't be allowed to keep her children. She can have them for one night, um, but after that, they were going to be taken away from her by uh, the Dekun, uh the wife, <laughs> the lady. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really understand. You'd be raised by his Daikun. Yeah, and, and kind of... And, his philosophies and everything like that, and, and of course she's, she's treated them with you know motherly loving care and everything. Um, and so there's this great scene where she is um, consoling her children and telling them, you know, I, we're going to get you out of there. You know, the children, we're going to get you to Earth. 
you can escape. I have to stay. Um, and it's just the, the most heart-wrenching scene of trying to uh, explain that to, to baby Artesia um, and, and telling her that, you know, I, I promise that I'll come. I, I can't come now, but I'll come later. When the moon is, is full, a hundred times is when I'll come. Uh, and and just like them, when they're just settling down for the night and, and our teacher is just sitting there uh, practically in tears, like, I, you know, I don't want to go to sleep. I want to stay with you. Like, cause as soon as I fall asleep, that'll mean tomorrow is coming and we'll have to leave. And, I mean, it, it is a heart-wrenching scene. It is beautifully animated. Like, again, this is, this is one of the scenes where the emotions really play on Pascal, even though he's kind of in the background of the scene. And he doesn't really have so, any dialogue either. It's just his face. No, yeah. And you, you just see his facial responses to the news and, and sympathizing with his sister. That, that, was, that was one of the big things where I was kind of talking about his gradual things. You can really see that he, he is right there feeling those emotions with her about their their mother and but, but he has to put the armor on mm -hmm. or at least he thinks he does and that's we're starting to see a trend uh, like we we see it even just in this episode that Cosball is going to be the one to take the emotional hits so Artesia doesn't have to mm -hmm. and that wears on a person especially a child like so, yeah, we, like, we have to watch him deal with that. That's tough stuff. I mean, that that's a scene you can take out of any any good drama. Like, it doesn't have to be a, a movie about giant robots. It's, it's a family moment um, and about tragedy to come. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Did you want to go right now? Would you like me to? I think you should go. Um, some of my, uh, favorite scenes, um, one that definitely comes to mind is basically any interaction between Ramba and Hamon. Because mm -hmm. they're, the way they play off of each other is just fantastic, and Hamon herself is so great. Like, I, I mean, I, I goosed about how cool Ramba is, and I goosed about Hamon a little bit too, but just... How they enact the plan, especially to save the Daikun children, is nothing short of fan freaking tastic. Everything about them is brilliant. Yeah, I love that's selling it short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, there's a scene where, uh, especially when uh, Hamon beats the crap out of a couple of the um, Federation gun tank pilots for trying to sexually harass her. And that was just really well animated and very cool. Mm. <laughs> um, Talk about that whole scene <laughs> overall. Uh, yeah, I guess everyone's <laughs> expecting me, at least these two chuckleheads are expecting me to talk about it. Because for those of you at home who don't know, I love Gun Tank. Um, it started as an ironic love and then it turned into real love. Woo, Gundam vs. Zeta Gundam, go buy it. <laughs> um... And uh, the fact that there is, I, I, I said to Reyna and Archimise as we were watching the climax of the episode, it is a gun tank fight. It is an all gun tanks fight. Because this is, where this takes place, the mobile suit proper hasn't been developed yet. So you really just have the Federation with these prototype gun tanks. And uh, Kosfal, when he's going crazy, just taking out Federation gun tanks, and at the same time, you have Artesia and her heart breaking and seeing these people dying and begging Cosfall to stop. But at the same time, I'm seeing... You gun have beautifully animated gun tanks firing at each other and one say, going kind of crazy and driving in circles on the street. I was going to say, and, but at the same time, yeah, you get this beautifully animated gun tank fight. And I'm like, this is everything I wanted, but it's also everything that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Like... So, oh, man. I want to talk about, like, Archimai has already hit a lot of 
the other really strong scenes for me were like the tower scene. Like I was cr- literally crying through that he entire was. bit. But then you get you get gun the gun tank scene where I'm not sure if I should be heartbroken or or, or joyous just from the fact that there is a gun tank. Actually, fight. no. What what you said is. I want to be sad and cry, but gun tanks on screen, so I can't help myself. But, I'm laughing. But gun tanks are fighting, and I'm so happy. My short range weapons are my long range weapons. My short range weapons are long range weapons, you guys. Hey, check out my long range weapons. Kapoo! Check out my short range weapons. Kapoo! Notice that they're the same thing. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Delightful insanity. We definitely oh. needs to uh, to put together our reviews of like Gundam games that are awesome. We should really do. It, uh, note to self: people in the comment section, get on our case about this. Uh, at some point, the three of us need to record a podcast of Gundam games that are worth playing because mostly so that we can goose about Gundam vs. Zeta, Gundam uh, ST, Gundam Capsule Fighters, uh, and, and Gundam Breaker Two. There's some others out there. I'm well, saying that yeah. we just need to get about those in particular. Yeah, those, it's true. Those three, okay. especially. And you can talk about your Dreamcast game. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, those, uh, those and just generally any of the political scenes, I just really enjoyed. How about um, bumping it over to Reyna, finally? I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed the, uh, the encounter between Cassilia and Char. Mm-hmm. Baby shark. The, uh, <laughs> the, the one involving handcuffs. <laughs> because there were, like, three. <laughs> and throwing children around. Um, I really liked it because it, it showed the person that Char was going to become. It was the closest thing to a precursor to the Dakar speech that we were ever going to get. And the precursor to who he was going to become in Char's counterattack was that Char in that room that night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his, he basically defined the entire rest of his life in that encounter with Cecilia. And when he said that he was going to take the zombies down, he meant that. Uh-huh. Holy crap. I mean, like, the cojones on this kid. Like, he just straight up from the beginning of the discussion, uh, he's like, we can talk about your brother's death all you want, but only after we talk about you killing my dad. Like, <laughs> I just realized that he, that Cecilia is the first zombie he told that to, and she is the last one to go. Oh my God! Yas, you genius! <laughs> I, I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> she she definitely uh she was definitely hit the hardest with the death of her entire family. And it makes Karma Space Island that flashback right before. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, um, the, the weirder thing is that it does kind of have parallels with Dharma's space on. Yeah, we, which, is, which is good. I, I think it's, it's worthy of being bad because Garbo on Space Island was adorable and had Hawkeye Island too, so... <laughs> um, and, um, my other favorite scene, because I, I have two that I wanted to mention, mm-hmm. not, not just Baby Shar being what he was to become, being but also, um, that was that was Char's last hope was that stand and I want to mention his last happiness as I mentioned earlier in the mm. video well in the podcast um, is the first time he sees space the first time he sees the stars the sun and the moon and the realizes look, how small the colony is the like, look of happiness and joy on his face is pure and it is the last time that we will, the first and last time, really, that you will ever see Char that happy. Like, genuinely that happy. I should call him Coswell because mm-hmm. he's not Char yet. Mm-hmm. Um, Chill ran down my spine during that scene. Um, you can call him Quattro. Like, <laughs> I, I literally had tears crawl, flowing down my face. And... You know, I read the manga, but I really, really wanted him to say the thing that... I really wanted him to say the thing that Camille said. Oh, the... Look at the stars and how pretty they are. It... I love any time Gundam takes a moment to show how small people are in 
like, comparison to, like, just the vastness of the universe. And that was a really very powerful scene and a great way to end the episode. It was, it was also really strong to me because I'm going to make a parallel to a movie that very few people have seen, but I'm going to reference it anyway. Okay. It was very similar, the dialogue over the song, to that of Yui Cardi's monologue in End of Evangelion. I wouldn't say that's a movie few people have seen. It's just, I'm, I'm just saying it's one that's hard to get a hold of, yeah, and the only way to watch it right now is to be really strong. And so I'm going to say very few people have seen it, just to cut things short. Um, <laughs> it is some... It was... One of those speeches that, while I was reading the subtitles and also watching everything on screen, so it kind of muddled together a little bit, <laughs> I I definitely, definitely had tears coming down my face from mm. the words that were being said. And it was, it was that same kind of hopefulness, except unlike End of Evangelion, this was an empty kind of hope, because I know what lies in their future. This is, yeah, this is a very, I feel very strongly that this was, this is one of the, str- this, uh, this is a very good opening episode. I'm ho- if the rest of the OVA keeps up this quality, this, I'm willing to say this might, this is, at least from a character and story perspective, this might be our strongest OVA yet. Also, I'd like to point out that a hundred, hundred full moons is approximately equivalent to just under eight years. I Thanks, feel that Randy. that's important to say. Well, mm. Um, is there anything else do we want to talk? Is there anything else we want to touch on that we thought that was just interesting, good, bad? Um, other uh, on that scene, I did uh, want to mention one thing that I thought was really kind of poignant. Um, that I thought they they did really well with the characters is that that concept that they've they've lived in their the colony their whole lives. That means when they look up, they see the other side of the colony. Mm-hmm. This is the first... They're seeing sky <laughs> for the first time. It's the first There's, time their sight, line of sight doesn't have an end. Mm-hmm. I, I just... I just love that kind of concept. It, it's, it's like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy pointing out that you, when you stare up into the sky, you're looking into infinity. Yeah, yeah, this is like, that's a, this is actual high concept science fiction. I love that. I mm-hmm. love it. Ugh. Sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is a really good OVA. Also hey. the song at the end was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I was just trying to think if there was anything that really kind of stood out as things that didn't work so well. I uh, <laughs> Obviously we've been gushing Robots! about I yeah the, the, the opening scene. scene for yeah for some reason I think it was a really bizarre choice to use I and again I'm guessing here so don't I mean maybe I'll turn out to be wrong I'm guessing they're using the Battle of Loam the 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 battle that they they referenced back in the second episode of Mobile Suit Gundam where Char sunk the the five ships I'm guessing they're going to use that as a framing device to because like because we only got through three ships mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I'm guessing they're going to use it as this, like, framing device of, well, this is where the series is going to end, with Char becoming Char Asnable. But we're going to lead up to that point. I'm guessing that they meant it that as a framing device. But that sequence, I get the feeling it was there to keep in the model-buying crowd. It, it honestly was animated as if it was a complete afterthought. Yeah, they it, don't have in-betweens on the people, and it, that really bothered me. Well, it was CG. It was entirely CG. No, I'm saying the, the people that were drawn in there. I, I, yeah, I can, it, 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 it looked like one of the Gundam video game cutscenes, and it played out really fast. Like, almost too fast for you to follow anything. Yeah, I couldn't follow it. it there, there was so many things on screen happening at once, which, you know, <laughs> back in the day, that's you know, what everyone wanted, but when... With like, when shows were kind of limited on, on certain things, right. and they really had to focus on one thing, I, I think that it leaves a stronger impression than you know, just throwing like you know there was like fifty odd ships or something on the screen, and there's just bullets flying back and forth, and rockets and mobile suits. And I didn't know what robot I was supposed to be looking at. 
But other, other than the red one, I other than the red one, there were green <laughs> ones, there were blue ones, there were purple ones. I did not know which one I was supposed to be looking at. I'll I'll say okay, the the things I enjoyed about that sequence. I enjoyed seeing denim and slender. That was kind of funny. Uh, I called the camp guy. And I, I enjoyed seeing Char axe kick a fighter plane. That was fantastic. Mm-hmm. But that being said, yeah, it went by too fast, and I, I'm sorry, the scene was there to sell model kits, because if they wouldn't have done that, Gun Tank would have been the only mech that appears in the entire episode. And I strangely would have been fine with that. Well, I would have too, but keep in mind, where does Gundam get its money from? The, so I and I mean it's even worse when you look at it this way. Just I think it was either last year or two years ago, Bandai's big release was the the black TriStar high mobility Zaku. And sure enough, you can barely see them, but the black TriStar high mobility Zaku is there. And what else is there? There's Shar Zaku with this big rifle that has never appeared in the manga, in the old anime in anything before, it was just on the model, so, and even the way they used it in the animation, it was almost like they were acknowledging that, because you see Char, like, shoot it, like, twice, and then he immediately throws it away, as if it's like, well, it's on the toy, so I'm obligated to use it, (laughs) all right, onward to the iconic bazooka, like, (laughs) yeah, like, yeah, the, the, yeah, we, yeah, (laughs) it's, it's, it's still impressive from a technical level, um, but from kind of an artistic and and uh, uh, theming level, it, it kind of falls flat with the rest of the episode. And, and was was it Cow Warrior? Was it Anno who said the ships are moving too fast? It was Anno who said that. I'm I'm totally agreeing with Hideaki Anno on this one. What I'm going to say, what I'm wow, that's rare for you. I know, right? I know, <laughs> I know right? <laughs> What I'm going to say I'm hoping for is uh, comparing it to another anime in, in Peacemaker Kurogane, one of my favorite um, samurai anime. They The first episode opens with a brief montage of the Battle of Ikidaya, and it makes no sense in the context of the quick flash forward that you get in that first episode. But I'm hoping that maybe the series will end at the Battle of Loam and we'll actually get to see... The, the footage played maybe a little slower and be able to make sense of it so it's not just a bunch of things shooting at each other. Because unless you're a walking mobile uh, weapon encyclopedia like I am, that scene will have no bearing on anything. I, I didn't think that worked. But that was really, like, it for me. Honestly, you guys, <laughs> like, the rest of the OBA worked really well, if you ask me. Can I talk about the art now? Yes, like, like please the do. Good things on the art? Speaking of the art, go ahead. Okay, so like, okay. I need to decompress a little bit because I get really excited about art, obviously. <laughs> but, um, because that's what I talk about in all these videos, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. They very, very clearly... There were some frames in the OVA that were directly taken from the manga. And a lot of the ones that weren't were directly taken from the original series, which was really yeah. nice. I and, really liked that. And the character designs were more yas than a lot of things have been in the past. Um, and it was very, very nice. The only way that it would have gotten better for me is if it would have done in watercolor revision, a.k.a. if we had gotten Shinbo to work on it, except like only given him control over the painting aspect I was about of things, to say, yeah, there's, there's, not there's, the actual direction. There's not enough stuff for him to be a huge pervert over in this series. <laughs> I don't know, there's Sailor and Hamon. Oh dear. Um, but, um, to expand on who Shimbo is, Shimbo, uh... We don't need to just, we de- don't need I, to I stay just, on Shimbo. I just need to say who he was so that people aren't like, what, what? Uh, he did Madoka Magica. Yeah, that guy. Mm. And Sasami had gone by one other thing from the technical aspects that I'd like to point out that was good, the music. Music was phenomenal. Um, the original song they used at the end was great. The background music was fantastic. But the the other one that stuck out during your favorite scene, the, the Kasfal and uh, Cassilia scene, 
the music they used in the background there was from the original series. Mm -hmm. They used tracks from the original Emmett Mobile Suit Gundam soundtrack, and I really appreciated that. It made it feel more like it was. this is an actual part of the Gundam mythos, and I love it for that. And it, it definitely helps, because that is, a ver that is very much a soundtrack that is a product of its time. Uh, mm. How heavy, the heavy reliance on the strong instrumental track mm -hmm. is something very reminiscent of 70s anime. And mm -hmm. it doesn't go techno, and it doesn't go in, it doesn't go vocal. Can, can we all just agree that it's really great that they decided not to use dated music in this at all? Like, that they, it's very, that it, it's just a kind of a timeless piece of, I, I really appreciate, with an exception for, of course, the 70s anime music, which was totally appropriate. Yeah, I, I really like that it's they did It's the tone, because 70s character designs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like... This is the prettiest 70s anime I've ever seen. Tell. So, do, do, do you guys have any other thoughts you want to talk about, or just... Um, I, I will say it was, it was really interesting getting more of some of these other characters that, like Cecilia in particular. Um, mm. I It's been a long time since I watched the original series as the series. Uh, I've mostly watched the movie version, where she, you know, has a pretty limited role. Uh, so, like, seeing her character really expanded um, was really interesting for me. Uh, I think she's, she's definitely a powerful character, and we, we, I think you see her during her more posturing um, kind of stage in life and until as she goes on to become the very kind of manipulative and, and plotting person that she becomes. Mm. Where she, every scene that she was in, she wanted you to know that she was there. <laughs> yeah, she very. dominated the scene. She really did. The pink uniform didn't help. And the red hair. I, I like the pink uniform. I, I know. I really classic. enjoy the, the pink uniform because, like... This coming from the person who wants to cosplay Cecilia. <laughs> okay. To be fair, in this situation, I don't feel like it's a gender-oriented color on her. No, I, I, I agree. I think that is something that is purely rank. Yeah, no, I agree. And normally in Gundam, when it's a pink uniform, I'm like, oh, it's pink because girls, thank you, Fraubo. You're the only one wearing a pink uniform. All the girls right. on white, basically. I'm, I'm mostly... <laughs> picking on Fraubo. It's just Fraubo didn't get tights, because... Because <laughs> they ran out. I guess. Um, I'm in her size. We'll go with them. And it's like, um, hmm, it's, it's a lot of fun sitting and seeing how powerful female characters are in Gundam. Also, I'd like to point out there was an African-American in this, in this one. Which, newscaster. He was a newscaster, but he was it's there. It's still important. He was there. That is like... <laughs> and so one of the rare descendants of so Claudia. Rare in the first century anything. That is something of note. And I hate that that's something of note. That it wasn't a racist caricature either. That was welcome. Mm -hmm. um, all in all, uh, if you guys, if for some reason you're listening to this and haven't watched the episode yet, go watch it. It is it is more than a worthy successor, or excuse me, prequel to the original Gundam. And uh, You'll laugh, you'll cry your heart out. And I have some good news for the three of us, and all of you listening at home. Oh. Um, volume 2 of Gundam The Origin, the trailer is already out. It will be coming to us this fall. So, hopefully, <laughs> we won't be having the long waits we did with the unicorn. Okay, um, speaking of trailers, yeah, this trailer left me worried for the first episode. Yeah, wow, it blew... It definitely blew all my expectations out of the water, especially considering my favorite scene was one of the ones that they debuted in the... In the trailer. first ever trailer. And I was just like, wow, the acting in this scene is garbage, and this is one of the scenes that I'm looking forward to. And then in, in context, it was like, it, wow. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, okay, so any uh, last thoughts? Archimise? Um, 
<laughs> touched on a lot of a lot of it. Uh, I I was thoroughly impressed uh, with this series. Uh, definitely looking forward to to it going forward. Um, again, I'm I'm one of the few of us that uh, hasn't read that far into uh, the origin yet. I I'm actually on book five. <laughs> I haven't opened it yet. Oh, so you're you're going to get to this stuff actually? Because the yeah, <laughs> this is the first half of book five, really. Right. Well, it's the first... Uh, first third, really. Uh, I'm going to say first two-fifths. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. It's phenomenal. Well, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, the, the manga so far has been fantastic. Um, and, as you know, you guys were saying that it stays pretty close to it, and I can definitely respect that, um, you know, pulling from the, the best. And, and as... As kind of Gundam overall, that's kind of coming out right now. Um, it's kind of between Build Fighters Try and uh, and re- 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 kind of just the just the G Reco. Let's just call it. Let's G. call it that. Recon Gista of G. I, I spell it differently every single time I type it out. <laughs> it, uh, he skypes me to ask if it. Uh, about watching it, and he spells it differently every time. It's <laughs> um, so, like, this, you know, Bill Fires Try has a, has a, is feeling a great, uh, I think, need of, of the Gundam franchise now, and I, I think this is definitely also a worthy um, a piece that uh, I think a lot of old fans will enjoy. I think it I think it can also bring in a whole lot of new fans, too, and that, that's yeah. really important for the series. I'd be interested to see what showing this to people, to, like, a viewer who has never seen the original. I'd love to see their reaction, to see if it would get them interested in, in, at, least, in uh, at least reading the rest of the manga, if not watching the original anime. Gundam, it's not all about robots. Mm-hmm. Because this is perfect for when we talk about how Gundam is more character-driven than it is robot-driven, and this is the best example of that so far, I'd say. It's because the robots are driven by the character. Oh, like, I, would actually I see what totally, you did there. Yeah, <laughs> I would actually totally pay people the $4 it would cost to download it, this, to watch it, because people need to see this. Really fantastic OVA. Um... I'm glad it's out there. I'm, it was worth the wait. Can't wait for part two, but I have to. So this fall, we'll be coming back at you guys. Um, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. And maybe somewhere in between, the, these two doofuses are going to talk about Reconquista of G, because I'm not going to. <laughs> but uh, all three of us might be able to get together and talk about uh, Build Fighters. Which, which is going to be great. That one's going to be fantastic. Which will be super fun. And probably also about games. End game. Let's try to... So, yes, more Gundam pod... Uh, will there be more Gundam podcasts? Of course. Hell yeah, of course. It's us, you guys. Um, things are coming back together. This is Team Izumi. Um, yeah, go rent Gundam The Origin. Uh, Do it now. Don't buy the $100 Blu-ray. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't say that. Support the official release of Gundam. Support the official release? But if you <laughs> ask me, wait... Wait, wait for a DVD release. I would say wait for Right Stuff's DVD release. It's gonna be. It's not gonna be a hundred dollars. I can tell you that right now. And the art books are available significantly less expensively elsewhere. Yeah. Um. But yeah, do do uh do get this. Do watch it. In uh support more Gundam. This is what we need more of because this is very. This was a very good OVA. Um. I think it's time to sign off. Uh. One last thing. Okay. Also, if you ever draw fan art from Gundam the Origin, submit it to Vertical, the people who publish Gundam the Origin, because they will freak out and love it. They'll, <laughs> they'll reblog it on the Tumblers. And it's on the true. Twitter and, and on, on the Facebook. The they absolutely love when people talk about Gundam. So, literally, they cosplay it. So, just... Buy the books, read the books, fan art, the, fan art the Gundam. And watch the anime, because this is fantastic. And much more Lucifer art, please, say thanks. <laughs> All right, um, <laughs> coming at you as always, uh, Team Izumi, we are signing out. I am Nick Izumi. I'm Raina Innocenti. And I am Archimai.
Um, can't wait to uh, talk about more Gundam with you guys again. If uh, Feel free to share your own comments right down in that comment, the comment section. And remember to keep on spocking in the free world. And also remember that one cannot be held accountable for the mistakes of one's youth. Ooh. She did the thing. <laughs> <laughs>